Welcome, everybody, to the new KQED. Thrilled to have you. My name is David Marcus, and I'm the executive in charge of KQED Arts and Culture, KQED Food, and I'm executive producer of Check, Please! Bay Area. And I'm delighted to welcome you tonight to KQED Live from the Commons and our newly renovated, newly imagined headquarters right here in the Mission. KQED Live is new, multi-platform, live events series dedicated to bringing journalism to life on stage, amplifying our local culture and building community. Our aim is to make KQED's mission to inform, inspire, and involve tangible. We do this through performances, conversations, storytelling, film screenings, food tastings, and other live interactive experiences. And importantly, we do this because in the act of gathering, in the act of coming together, we grow our collective sense of imagination, empathy, and responsibility. And before we get into tonight's program, in the spirit of empathy and responsibility, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Here at KQD headquarters, we are located on the occupied lands of the indigenous Ramatush Ohlone people. To honor both the land and the people who stewarded it for thousands of years, we must acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from the territory. This while we also honor and respect the many indigenous people still connected to this land. Thank you for reflecting with me on these facts. Now, on to tonight's program. We are especially pleased to be presenting a conversation and cooking demo with renowned chef, educator, activist, and James Beard Award winner, Bryant Terry, hosted by Check Please Bay Area producer, Cecilia Phillips. And Cecilia will tell you more about Chef Terry in a moment. Meanwhile, some thanks. First, to our seasoned sponsors, without whom shows like this would not be possible the Asian Art Museum, Berkeley Rep, Comcast Business and Oakland International Airport. Deep gratitude for their commitment to supporting our mission of civic and cultural engagement in the Bay Area. As you may have seen, during the pre-show, we had a mobile trivia quiz sponsored by Comcast Business. We have KQED water bottles for all the folks who answer the most questions correctly. And those folks are, wait for it, Number one, Adi O, you're a winner. <laughs> Secondly, BG, where's BG? Initials BG. All right, well, moving along, Patrick L, are you here? Yes, there's Patrick. But importantly, I also want to thank all of you for being among the first members of the public to bring this space to life. You can learn more about other upcoming events and purchase tickets at kqed.org slash live. OK, now, it's my great pleasure to bring to the stage our host, my colleague, Cecilia Phillips. As mentioned, she is a broadcast video producer for Check, Please, a digital video producer for KQED Food, and she has long been a part of the Bay Area food scene, working under several celebrity chefs, hosting cocktail competitions to raise money for charities, and serving as a San Francisco culinary tour guide. You can watch her on Channel 9 every, every week, every Thursday, or reruns all week long, Check Please Bay Area, hunting down off the grid extra delicious dining experiences in her, in her signature segment on this season's Checks Please spinoff, You Gotta Try This. So please, welcome Cecilia Phillips. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and welcome to all of you. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, but this is our first KQED food live event. So thank you for being here. Yes. 
Um, we have a jam-packed evening full of fun and exciting things for you all to learn about. Um, we are going to have an in-depth conversation with Bryant um, as he talks about many different things. Um, many of you may know that he just recently published a book. Um, we are going to talk about Black Food, which is his newest cookbook. Um, we are also going to have an interactive tasting. It looks like all of you have some boxes in front of you, yeah? beautifully uh, adorned with some ribbon. Um, I think you, you can see that there's a little note on there that says to just hold off before tasting. So we're going to get to that portion later. Um, and as a reminder, with this interactive tasting portion, if you could remain masked until that time, um, and then we'll just have you taste. And then if you could just replace your mask after, that would be amazing. Um, but first, I thought it would be a really great way to start off the evening with the way that Chef um, Bryant starts out his book. Um, you'll note this evening that this is so much more than a cookbook. Um, there are many different facets and layers to it. And I thought it would be great to start off um, by introducing the way that he introduces the book. Um, it starts with a prayer and reading um, from Reverend Marvin K. White, a poet, preacher, arts leader and organizer and public theologian and the current minister of celebration at Glide. Um, he will be reading this piece from the book and um, it especially moved me, so I hope it moves you as well. Um, I'd love to introduce uh, Reverend Marvin K. White. Hey everybody, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, that's the black church in me. <laughs> From scratch. On the first day, God made a meal plan. Finally had it all figured out. Finally had a taste for something. On the second day, God made a grocery list. One of everything God thought. On the third day, God planted a garden, God's own farmer's market. On the fourth day, God sharpened God's knives. God created iron and cast it into skillets. God preheated the oven and forgot all about it. We will talk about this hell another time. On the fifth day, God chopped and God baked and God boiled and God braised and God broiled and God fried and God grilled and God roasted and God poached and God steamed and God stewed. For hours, God stewed. On the sixth day, God opened up all the pots and a mist went up from the pots and watered the whole face of God. And God sweat the vegetables. On the seventh day, God created company and they came over and they ate with God and God looked around at God's kitchen and ended their work, which they had done, and they rested. On the eighth day, itis. This is the history of cooking by sight and by smell. This is the history of creation of the heavens and the earth and soul food before any Tupperware, before any tinfoil, before anybody said how they would have made it, God created satisfaction. So let us pray. Yes, God, the perfect planter, okra, okuru, kingumbo, the perfect picker, Kiabo, Kimbombo, Gumbo, the perfect pickler, Binda, Derosh, Vindakai, you who let creation stew on Sunday morning and ate gumbo and tomatoes, corn, and lima beans that afternoon, Bindakaye, Kikwi. Let us pray for the first and last suppers, and knowing that we can trace our divinity by the meals that we were served as our sacred text. Yes, for this new theology of gastronomy, thank you, God. This prayer whispered over everything and everyone. This blessing breathed over everything and everyone. This libation poured over everything and everyone. And this knowing that everyone gets fed. Bamiya, Bamye, Bamiha, Malondrone, thank you, my true vine. Thank you. Remind us you are in this slime with us. Thank you. Glory. We thank you for every plant we bit down to pick and for every muscle memory bending into this feast. Thank you for this meal, for this three, for this stretched into all of humanity. Thank you for this spread and for multiplying our love budget enough to send a plate to our neighbors and for making our eyes bigger than our stomachs. Rise and flower, Hercules Posey. 
Rise and flower, James Hemings. Rise and flower, Edna Lewis. Rise and flower, Lena Richard. Rise and flower, Lucille Elizabeth Bishop Smith. Rise and flower. Yeah, come and sit with me. <laughs> Let's hang out for a second. Um, <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here. You were at Glide before you came over here. You yes. were okay. Yes. So thank you for rushing over. Um, talk to me about this piece. What was the inspiration um, behind uh, this this poetry? Oh, awesome! Yeah, thank you so much. Sing? <laughs> yes, please sing. <laughs> um, it moved me. I opened this book, and you're expecting a cookbook that just contains recipes, right? Um, in the traditional sense but it's so much more. Yeah. It's a work of art. Um, there's so many different components, and this is what the reader uh, starts with. Yeah. Um, where is the inspiration from? Yeah, I, I don't know any black food pathway that doesn't begin with prayer, you know, with a blessing of the food, with a blessing of the hands that prepared the food, with the blessing of the ground that the food came from, um, that we return to. And I can hear, um, I can hear my, my mom, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, all stopping right before we eat to create this moment of intentionality. Look, y'all, we're getting ready to eat. And this is not promised us. Um, and let us mark this moment and let this food nourish our bodies. Um, and even if it is meager, we can pray it into something bountiful and full and filling, you know. Um, and it transforms the tasteless and the, the leavings that we are used to into a feast. And I'm honored that he asked me to bring that, you know, to this book. It's amazing. Um, there's some really interesting words that come toward the end, some different language. What is that all about? <laughs> I opened the book and read the piece for the first time since I submitted the piece. And so I had to go and listen to, say, to remember how to pronounce these words. So um, a lot of the words are gumbo and okra in all kinds of diasporic languages. So um, I did a little research and found out how to pronounce um, and how this word is pronounced around the world. And so I wanted to make sure that this okra, which is known around the world, is represented as the diasporic element you know, in this book, so. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for bringing the energy. If you want to leave me the book, and then you can have that on the lectern. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, without further ado, uh, Bryant Terry, as David mentioned, James Beard, an NAACP Image Award-winning chef. Um, he's an educator, author, and renowned for his activism for just sustainable food systems. Currently, the editor-in-chief for uh, four Color Books, a new imprint from Penguin Random House, and the chef in residence at the MOAD, the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, where he creates public programming exploring the intersection of food, farming, health, art, culture, and the African diaspora. If you would please join me in welcoming Bryant Terry. Let's keep it going for him, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Bring some energy to me. Margie, my maternal grandmother kept a cupboard in her kitchen that was about seven feet tall and a foot deep, each shelf crowded with glass jars full of preserves. Pickle pears, peaches, carrots, green beans, blackberry jam, figs, sauerkraut, and her not to be forgotten, Chow chow. Do we have any Southerners in the house tonight? Hello. Okay. <laughs> well, if you don't know what chow chow is, cabbage, onions, peppers, chopped finely, cooked for about five hours and served as a relish with leafy greens, collards, mustards, turnips, kale, dandelions. Listen, my grandmother could work magic in the kitchen. You knew she was cooking whenever you entered her house, even if you didn't smell it, because you'd always hear singing. Glory, glory. Hallelujah, when I lay my burden down, burden down, no more Monday, 
No more Tuesday when I lay my burden down. Whenever she rolled out the dough for her fried pies, it was as if her love and connection to spirit were additional ingredients that she folded in. I want to start by sharing, I, I started by sharing this memory of my family because it's vitally important that I ground the work that I do in history and memory. And I am always clear that everything I'm doing is standing on the, sh the shoulders of ancestors who came before me. You know, my blood ancestors, but also these political, intellectual, spiritual ancestors and mentors, who some of whom I met, many of them that I haven't. And, you know, the lessons that I've learned in terms of like growing food at home, eating lots of dark leafy greens, using food as a site to build community and bring people together. I learned that from my grandparents and I'm simply repackaging it for a modern audience such as yourself. So I wanted to give them respect and all the ancestors and elders who've come before. So thank you. I didn't know you were going to regale us with song. That's amazing. <laughs> and I, I just learned that you're a part time DJ. Um, you know, I have had an extensive I have an extensive collection of jazz on vinyl. So occasionally I might come out of retirement and do like a art gallery opening or intimate dinner party or something like that. You, know. you do a lot of different things. And I think that it comes through in this this book. I, I want to call it a book and not necessarily just a cookbook, because it's so much more than that. Um, I think two of the things that we just touched upon are really important as far as this particular piece, right? So not only have you incorporated recipes from across the African diaspora, but you've incorporated storytelling, poetry, prayer, um, and music. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought, what better way to start than have the Reverend come out and recite that piece, and we were able to incorporate that together. So that is the first thing that people are, are enticed with. Mm. But as with all of the other five other cookbooks that you've written, mm -hmm. um, this being your sixth, um, music is a big part of, of what you do, right? Yeah. Um, you all may not know this, but within this cookbook is an actual playlist that accompanies the book. Can yes. you speak on that really quickly? Um, I come from a musical family. My grandfather, Edward Bryant, started this uh, traveling gospel quartet, Eddie Bryan and the Four Stars of Harmony. And they would travel throughout the South in the 50s. And they were the first black um, group to be played on the radio in Memphis. Because Memphis is racist. Um, that's where I grew up. <laughs> uh, any Memphians in here? Anybody okay. from Memphis? No? I was going to say, you know. No. <laughs> um, when I was growing up, because my grandfather his love of music, all of his siblings, or all my mother and her siblings, they were connected to music in some way. From my mom, who sings in her church choir, to my uncle Don Bryant, who was uh, the house songwriter for High Records, which is a storied uh, record label in Memphis, uh, with people like uh, Willie Mitchell and Ann Peebles and Al Green, who are on the label. So music was just always a part of our lives and our gatherings. And when we gathered around food, music, community, you know, my, my, my family would always, not just bringing in our blood family, but people from their faith community, people who lived in their neighborhood. And so all these festive occasions that were at the intersection of like eating and community building and agriculture, because people would be cooking throughout the meal, literally going to the backyard garden and harvesting things to cook throughout the meal. And so I've always tried to bring that to my work because a part of my mission has been what I see is bridging this chasm that industri our industrialized food system has created where food is on one side of this commodity and then so many of the things that have been inseparable with food before our food system has been industrialized, like art and culture and community. They're way over here and the food's here. So I've been attempting to bridge that gap in, in various ways through you know, grassroots organizing, through my residency as chef in residence at Museum of the African Diaspora, and um, certainly through my, my books. Um, I think that one of the things that we talked about when we were preparing to talk about all the amazing things that you do is you mentioned the idea of cooking as a collage. So I think that that kind of ties in hand in hand, right? All of the things that you just mentioned. Um, maybe can you talk more about what cooking as a collage even means to you? I mean, you know, as a music aficionado and as someone who is a hip hop head, 
and grew up loving hip hop and is still just, you know, enamored of hip hop culture and music, like so much of my formative years was shaped by hip hop music and culture. And so when I think about just the, the its very nature of kind of like cutting and pasting and bringing these different musical elements together to create something new, it's been my approach with cookbook writing. And, and, and part of it is because when we talk about African-American cuisine, I think you can't talk about it without understanding that, I would argue, it's the first modern global uh, fusion, if you will. When you think about the, the ingredients and classic dishes and flavors that traveled from West and Central Africa to the Caribbean to the, you know, the United States, like you have this melding of food from the African continent, the indigenous foods of this country, the indigenous crops and flavors and, and, and foods from Western Europe. And so I think that, you know, in terms of my, you know, there's this quote in the book <coughs> that I actually want to read really quickly. And this is in the introduction to give a little context. In my graduate school advisor, Robin D.G. Kelly's 1994 essay collection, Imagining Home, Class Culture and Nationalism in the African Diaspora, I discovered a profound rumination by the late South African scholar activist Bernard Magobane. Diaspora consciousness arose from, quote, a determined effort on the part of black people to rediscover the shrines from the wreckage of history. And I, I just feel like one of the threats throughout my work has been helping us remember, piece back these histories. And so when I think about putting together recipes, one of the things I want us to remember is that, you know, African-American cuisine is, is intrinsically a diasporic cuisine. And, and the more that I can like bring together like elements from West and Central Africa and the Caribbean and all places that black people um, have traveled, it's my way of helping to like bring those stories back together and helping us remember that, you know, we're all connected. Um, I, I, we'll talk more about that later, but uh, one of the things that stuck out to me, and I wanted to ask you if this story was true, because I've, I've, I've watched a lot of interviews with you to get ready, right? So there's, <laughs> you've done amazing things. And so one of the things that you talk about was hip hop and how you were being influenced by kids your age. I think you're around maybe 10th grade and um, you're starting to kind of eat the foods that you see other kids are eating, right? Maybe getting a little bit unhealthy, um, kind of getting into the snack food realm. And <laughs> This is what you say in interviews. Fast food. Fast food. Okay, so stuff maybe not the most nourishing and <laughs> and and fulfilling, right? Yeah. Um, one of the things that you say is that a hip hop song actually was what kind of maybe tipped the scales for you in heading into a direction of vegan and vegetarian lifestyle. Is that true? It's true. I mean, one of the reasons that I, I started cooking and writing cookbooks is because. I, when I first started doing this work back in, when I, when I decided that I wanted to be more involved in this movement that we call food justice, you know, the efforts to ensure that everyone has access to healthy, fresh, affordable, and culturally appropriate food, regardless of skin color, zip code, income, um, I would go to these national gatherings and I would notice that the people in the rooms, when we're having these conversations around fixing our broken food system and ensuring that it works for everyone, it was funny to me that many of the people most impacted by our broken food system, whether it's migrant farm laborers or people living in urban centers, often described as food deserts, or you know, small to mid-sized farmers who are hanging on by a string, these people weren't in the room. And they weren't at the tables, they weren't driving the conversation. And I've always believed that when we think about social ills, we need to look at the people most impacted by the issues for the solutions. Because people living in you know, mar marginalized communities, communities in which they've been um, dealing with various forms of oppression, they're aware of it. And there are a lot of innovative solutions. What people need is power and resources shifted to them so that they can own and drive the solutions to the problems in their communities. So um, I feel like I'm kind of getting off track. What was the question again? No, it's OK. Uh, <laughs> oh, 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 I know what it was. You're talking about that moment. <laughs> yes. Um, and so you know, my main goal since I started doing the work is how can I widen that net? Kind of in response to those homogenous spaces, how can I widen the net, you know, make the table bigger for more people? And I realize there are a lot of class and educational biases in those spaces. 
And so for me, you know, I, I had to creatively think about, well, what would resonate with most people? And it's food. Like the thing that we're working, you know, it's like we're working for this theoretical better food system and we want to change public policies and land, you know, the way that food is shared and distributed in communities and all that. But what are we really working for? We're working so that people can have access to delicious food that's satisfying, that's nourishing. And so um, that's why I started writing cookbooks. But in terms of just my own trajectory and how I've been moved because it was a hip hop song that first um, awakened me to a lot of these realities. I would argue that, you know, that song um, Beef actually was a catalyst for me becoming a food activist. Um, so anyway, I feel like I should just kick the lyrics for you guys. I'm talking about it a lot, but <laughs> do, you, do you have any hip hop fans in the audience? Okay, four people. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, let me just say, if if you don't really like rap and you mostly consumed it from the corporate control radio, then I get it. I understand why you don't like it. It's, you know, very violent and homophobic and antisocial and misogynistic. But I grew up in this period that people often describe as the golden era of hip hop, where a lot of the music was socially conscious and politically charged. And so this is the period from which this song sprang. And the name of the group is Boogie Down Productions, one of the seminal groups in hip hop. Um, Karis one is the lead MC and Scott LaRock was the rapper and the DJ or the producer and DJ. Beef, what a relief. When will this poisonous product cease? This is another public service announcement. You can believe it or you can doubt it. Let us begin now with the cow, the way that it gets to your plate and how. The cow doesn't grow fast enough for man, so through his greed, he creates a faster plan. He has drugs to make the cow grow quicker. Through the stress, the cow gets sicker. 21 different drugs are pumped into the cow in one big lump. And just before it dies, it cries in a slaughterhouse full of germs and flies. It gets much more graphic, so I'll stop right there. <laughs> but, you know, um, thank you. like many people, I was under the illusion that, you know, cows are just kind of running around in the fields happily and they just go to sleep and end up on our plates. And this was a revelation to me, just like learning about the violence in our industrialized food system, the violence that animals have to endure and the impact that that has on human health and our environment. And, um... I, I went to my dad and it's like, yeah, dad, you gotta, I just heard this song and this rapper's talking about the animals and they do the drugs and the drugs in our system. He was horrified, but um, he told me he'd buy me the tape because we used to listen to these little plastic receptacles with magnetic tape. I heard about those. They're called cassettes, I think. They're called cassette tapes. <laughs> No, but my dad told me he would um, he'd buy me the tape if I first would read this book, The Jungle, by Upton Sinclair, and um, write him a one-page synopsis because he was it's, it's Tiger Dad. Um, <laughs> but um, that song, that book, those are the things that changed my habits, my attitudes, my politics regarding food, and so. You know, whatever, I could sit here and lecture for hours about these issues, but I know that sometimes the, 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 the appealing to people in a, a cerebral way may not be the best way to open up. Because the thing about food is so personal and people can get triggered, especially when you're talking about like alternative diets, people who might be omnivores and you start bringing up vegetarian and vegans because I'm sure they've had negative experience with vegetarians and vegans. Um, and I'm saying this because after... I heard that song, whatever stereotypes you might have about the most judgmental, dogmatic, self-righteous, finger wagging, on a soapbox, being the biggest asshole you've ever seen because they just became a vegan and you're trying to convince everybody that they should be one, even though you just started last week. That was me. <laughs> and <laughs> my, I, I apologize to my parents almost every day, like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. I was such a jerk. But you know, I, I don't regret that period because as an educator, especially someone who's working with young people, it just someone who's working with all types of people, it showed me that the least effective way <laughs> of inviting people into the conversation or encouraging them to change their habits and attitudes and politics regarding food is by yelling at them, screaming at them, making them feel guilty for being where they are on the journey. And as a young, as a teacher, as an educator, working with young people, that's kind of like, 
youth development one-on-one you have to meet people where they are yeah and so um you know it was really instructive and i feel like it helped to guide a lot of my approaches to you know thinking about and talking about these issues starting simple i mean you um uh, talk about the different ways that you do try to get people to start small, right? I think that uh, there's a few, a handful of ways that you mentioned that people can start to make a big difference in um, the world. I, I believe that you talk about, um, you know, growing your own herbs mm -hmm. as a start, um, starting to build community um, by shopping at farmer's markets, yeah. um, and then taking that exact produce that you buy there and then inviting more people that you know to enjoy the fruits of their labors and their own labors in cooking herbs by showing them that it's accessible, right? These yeah. are simple ways that people can make changes versus just jumping right in and, and changing their lifestyle completely. Meatless Mondays, mm -hmm. you mentioned, these small things. Yeah, I mean, the fact that my parents who are in their early 70s, the fact that they're constantly reevaluating what they're eating, how they're eating, and making changes is it I like I celebrate the small victories. Do my parents want to be like full on vegans or vegetarians? No, I don't necessarily think they need to unless they feel that drive to for themselves. Um, certainly I can make a lot of argument. I mean, look, I, I just want to be clear. I'm not here to say, hey, um, I want everybody to be a vegan because especially for health reasons, I think I can make arguments all day around like the economic, the environmental the ethical reasons not to be or not to eat animals, but in terms of um, you know this idea that a vegan diet is the perfect diet or the best diet that one has, I just think that there is no panacea. You know, we all have different bodily types and health status and cultural foods, and I think all those things should feed into what we consider a healthful diet. And what I've seen often is people kind of grabbing for what might be presented as or what they imagine the most helpful diet is. And then they could be just unhealthy because they're not checking in with their body. They're not checking in with, um, I don't know, the seasons, you know, just like so many things that I think we should be paying, paying attention to, like eating what's in season or eating what's locally grown, eating, you know, just whatever. So my point is, is that being I, more mindful. Yeah. Just a general mindful approach to eating, which I don't, I don't think that it has to always be confined by some particular dietary model. Um, well, let's talk about that. Let's kind of dive in. Um, this book is an obvious departure from what you've done in the past, right? So sixth book, um, mostly vegan vegetarian. Um, this, uh, has kind of been your, your, your standard, almost like a trademark of, of, of what you've been doing, but black food is not that. Um, it features a myriad of different dishes and some of which are very meat-centric. Um, why did you depart from that, um, that, that strictly plant-based thing? What, what made this book different? Well, uh, first of all, I just want to say that my name's on the cover and for obvious reasons, but I, this is not my book. This is a, a collective effort. I, I, I know what I'm good at. I'm good at I'm an Aquarius, so I'm good at envisioning what the world needs. I'm good at building a team. I'm good at moving a team towards that goal. And that's what I did. I brought together some of the smartest, um, most talented people working in food from Jenny Wapner, who is one of the most respected editors in food media, to um, George McCalman, our art director, who's based here in San Francisco, who Design designed the book and cover. beautiful cover. Um, Lillian Kang, one of the best food stylists in the business, Oriana Corrin, who photographed it, um, Jillian Knox, who's like just an artist. She's a prop stylist, but it just goes so much deeper the way that she tells stories through the propping for food and everything. So we, 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 we created this book together and I, I want to recognize all those folks. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting because now I'm a publisher. One of the things that we did after my literary agent, after we pitched Black Food, is that we went to Penguin Random House and we pitched me having my own publishing imprint. And and I think I need to give context about just from where the book came in this historical moment. Um, the book had always been an idea because I do this programming at um, Moat. And so has, have people been to Moat? I keep talking about our little small but mighty museum <laughs> um but if you haven't please check it out it's a very important space in a city like san francisco especially given the major out migration of african americans over the past couple decades you know um definitely check that out but 
2015, Linda Harrison, the former executive director, approached me after I had an artist residency at Grace Cathedral here in San Francisco. And she was thinking, whoa, we need to have some type of food programming at our museum. Because we had like this static exhibition about like the agriculture throughout the ages, but it just felt old and stay. It just didn't feel like dynamic and exciting. So we created this residency and, you know, I started using my resources and social capital and connections to bring to create this programming and like everything from panel discussions with scholars and authors and farmers and poets and activists to intimate conversations like this with um, authors to um, diaspora dinners. We had one in the museum, but then we shifted to the St. Regis next door, where we have these dinners celebrating the diversity and complexity of food throughout the African diaspora. And we would celebrate people like, you know, Tanya Holland, the um, chef here, um, and Michael Twitty, the public historian and um, cook. So um, I feel like you asked me these questions and I go all the way. <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, what I'll get was you back. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was basically uh, how this became, um, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, a departure from what you had done before and a less, um, you know, you incorporated meat dishes. And right. so there was an importance to that. And I think it was being able to showcase that through the African diaspora, there's there is more than just vegetables there's there's a lot that goes into it so. well I mean I think the main thing so well, yeah just to finish I, I since we started the programming at the museum I had always thought we need to take this magical brilliant thought-provoking cutting-edge programming I want the world to be invited in because back then you know 2015 we didn't have the infrastructure to do all the like you know virtual events and lives and it was kind of the ethos of like the moment you're stuck in time and then if you're there you're there if not come to the next program so literally many of the um, chapters in the book, the, the titles are literally lifted from programs I did at the museum, from the Black Women Food and Power program, which was the first one, to the Black Queer Food um, program I did, to Land Liberation and Food Justice. Like these were programs that I did, but I felt like they deserved a chapter in the book. And so when it came to curating the contributors, uh, one, we were in the midst of a pandemic and we, wanted to get this book out quickly and I knew that everyone didn't have the chops to necessarily offer a plant-based dish and I don't want to have people working outside of their wheelhouse so that was an issue that I was aware of it's like if you don't make good vegan food already I don't want you just coming in here and putting some crap that I'm going to say well I'm sorry I, this is not going to work because it's good <laughs> um, but the the biggest thing is I really wanted to give people space to authentically tell their story about their connection to African diasporic food and if it included animal products, then that's their story. And I wanted them to have the, the space to do that. And I encourage people. I mean, I wasn't overly prescriptive, but I did um, tell people that, you know, if you can offer a plant-based option, that would be great. And I'm, I'm happy that the majority of the recipes are vegetarian and vegan, but mm -hmm. they, we do have some animal products in here. So let's talk about that. We, um, this book is created through the pandemic, right? So <laughs> at the very start, February, 2020, Vegetable Kingdom comes out. It's been published, right? So right before, yep. you know, everything kind of changes for everybody yeah. <laughs> in a major way. I had been on the, I had started a tour and I had done like four cities and then all that got shut down. So basically from that, you found that through that time, um, our social environment at that time, you know, we're dealing with uprisings in our nation. It's, uh, there's all of this response nationwide about the murder of George Floyd. Um, and then this somehow became an impetus for you to be able to like just push this idea of this book that you wanted for a while mm -hmm. into production. How did you somehow make a book happen during this time? <laughs> um. I don't know, man. I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm still spinning. Um, I, I wanted to read you something, actually. Um, it's an email that I sent to all the contributors. But, you know, I, on the heels of the murder, the state murders but of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the uprisings, like, those things really pushed me to dig deeply because I felt like this was a historical moment. I mean, it was a historical moment. It was a movement moment. We saw the energy, a lot of what people have been holding just kind of like exploding in that moment. And I just, I always talk about how with social movements, whether it's food justice or, um, you know, just larger movements for racial justice, 
I think it's important for us all to think about how we might be able to contribute, right? I used to make the mistake when I was younger of reducing activism to strictly on the ground, confrontational grassroots organizing, which I would argue is the most important part of you know movement building. But as I matured, I had to just get over that like narrow way of thinking about what activism means because I don't know if it makes sense for my 70 year old parents to be like in the streets protesting like that. Like they did that a long time ago, but there are other ways that they can contribute, whether it's like the philanthropic giving, philanthropic giving that they do or volunteering their time like my dad does. So I, I'm always ta- asking people to consider how you can contribute to the food justice movement, you know, moving beyond just consumer change, because is it, I'm, I'm excited that more people are conscious about, you know, eating locally and buying fair trade and supporting small farmers and artisans. But the problem I have is that so often I found people, um, they see consumer action as the primary way of changing our food system. And I don't think we can buy ourselves out of this broken food system. I think there are other ways that we need to, and I'm not like, yes, we need to vote with our dollar. Like every dollar we spend at the farmer's market, typically the farmer will get 90 cents on the dollar. Whereas if you go to the corporate owned supermarkets, it's the exact inverse or or maybe fewer um, (laughs) pennies that they get. And so, you know, I, um, yeah, the activism, this was my activism. This was my way of pushing back against the historical erasure and marginalization and you know all the ways in which our people have been mm-hmm. um, oppressed in this country. But more specifically, it was the revelation that came in this movement moment where a lot of reckoning across many fields and genres was happening about racism in media, specifically food media. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the legacy, a a few of the legacy food media companies had been called out for some of their unsavory um, ways of treating their BIPOC employees, failure to support them. And so, you know, I I felt like this book was important because it needed, we we needed a project that gave voice Mm -hmm. to the the people of the African diaspora. And I was looking for the quote, but the quote that I sent to every contributor to the book was a quote by Toni Morrison in which she asks us to imagine what our lives look like without racism. If we're not, you know, hindered by this albatross of white supremacy, when we can just sink into our joy, our magic, our creativity, our brilliance, our agency, then what does that look like? And I wanted that to be the the, the, the thrust of the book. You know, you can't talk about these stories without touching on those things. But there are a lot of books that do that. And I wanted this book to be about celebration and, and, and joy and excitement. And so that was my offering for, you know, the movement in 2020. And getting the publishing imprint was actually a way of further contributing to the movement because, you know, we need to diversify food media. And the more and, and the reason that food media tends to be so um, white is because the people in publishing houses who are making decisions about what projects get acquired um, and, and what's valuable, these decisions are often made by white people. And so I think you have to have more people like me, like you, in these um, positions of power to actually affect change and move things along. I mean, one of the things that you discuss in a KQED article, actually, with our own writer, Luke Sai, is that um, you wanted to put a spotlight on food stylists, prop stylists um, in the black community to help create this this book, right? And there's this idea that these people don't exist, right? That they're, you just can't find them, that you proved otherwise. Well, that's the excuse. You know, oftentimes when I've been, not my, just my projects, but just hearing from other creatives, the excuse is often, well, we look for a black photographer, but we couldn't find one, or food stylist, or prop stylist, you know, and I know they're out there because these are people in my community. These are people I'm interacting with. So in addition to publishing books, Four Color Books has an action arm where we're going to really put teeth into diversifying food media and creating pipelines. We, we're in the midst of uh, planning a black food summit at Moab, which would gather people from throughout the diaspora for skill sharing, community building, and um, networking. But we decided to push it till the spring. But in addition to that, we're amassing databases of black art directors, or I should say BIPOC. You know, a lot of the focus is, th- because of this book, 
we needed black folks to bring this book to life, but I'm interested in bringing all types of um, folks of color into um, this food space and trying to support budding authors and food stylists and prop stylists or whatever. So we're going to have these databases so that the excuse can no longer be, well, we can find anyone because we're, we're handing it to you here. You, you, we got everything you need right here. Um, but I just wanted to go back to a point when you were talking about like, like those every, what I think about is like everyday acts of resistance, you know, like growing fresh herbs or making meals at home. When, when I was in grad school, my advisor, Robin Kelly, his second scholarly monograph with this book called Race Rebels. And he was looking at labor movements outside of traditional labor unions and actually looking at many of the kind of everyday acts of resistance that black folks had in the mid 20th century in terms of like them having agency and pushing back against capitalism and white supremacy in the workplace. And he talked about things like, you know, breaking tools or work stoppages or quitting on the spot. And what that book helped me to understand or helped me reimagine were these things that we might see as apolitical, like growing food in a garden at home or just making meals or gathering friends and family around the table. And I, you know, they're highly political, dare I say radical, in a food system that's largely controlled by a handful of multinational corporations that don't want you eating with your family. They want you at their restaurant or some fast food joint. They don't want you growing food at home because they want you going to the supermarket and buying their um, products. They don't want you, um, they want you just eating over the sink and going to your next job because you can't survive off of one job because it doesn't pay a living wage. Yeah. And so um, I, I, I always say that whatever you can do, like these things are important. And then the things that seem like it's not political, I would argue that they are. Yeah. Well, one thing that we can all do this evening is to try some amazing food, right? Okay. You've provided some treats for everyone this evening. I did. I didn't provide them, but um, Chef Lala Harrison, this brilliant chef in Oakland, made three of the um, recipes from my various books. So I think one is from Afro Vegan, one is from Vegetable Kingdom, and... Um, Maybe one is from Black Food. <laughs> we're about to find out. <laughs> so we're going to have a little fun. Um, so you all have boxes in front of you. And um, this is the part where you can, you know, I guess we can have them remove their masks to eat, right? That would probably be helpful, I would imagine. Okay. So um, we have uh, three different things inside of there for you. Now we're going to play a little game. This is going to be fun. And we didn't let you know this, but there's swag. There's prizes. So you can actually win some stuff. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Ryan, here to the side. Yeah. So um, what we're going to do is this. Um, we're going to have you start with um, kind of identifying um, the way that one ingredient can be multi-purposed to create some variety <laughs> in your diet, right? You know, the, the, one of the complaints that people say, oh, okay, well, I don't want to eat vegetarian. It's boring. It's, you know, there's just not enough uh, different t types of things to try, right? you're gonna show that that's not true. And we're gonna actually taste and interact and kind of learn how one ingredient can have a multitude of purposes. So we'll um, begin by having you try to figure out what the ingredient is that goes throughout each of these three dishes. Um, so I have a feeling that someone's gonna get this really quickly because <laughs> the- Because they can read. Because <laughs> they can read. And in the center is our first dish, but we'll make it a little bit harder. But so the first person who can raise their hand and let us know, oh, okay. I think uh, it's over here, Ryan. I'm gonna have you head that direction. And with the scrunchie, if I think I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna say that that was the first hand that I saw shoot up. Um, what do you think is the one ingredient that is prevalent throughout these three? There you go. It's just that simple, folks. Yeah, you're, you're, but I don't know that she should get it that, that quickly. So we'll do one more thing. How, how was the plantain prepared? What, what do you think um, the preparation for the plantain was? Did you, did you try it yet? Okay. <laughs> um, how do you think that the plantain was prepared? Um, what was, oh, just right in the center. So yeah, the plantain chip there. So go ahead and give that a try. Um, how, how was it prepared? I'm going to give, um, like bake, baked or fried? Okay, we'll go with, we'll say what it, it was. It was deep fried. Deep fried, deep fried. all right. Uh, 
I wanted to make it even harder. <laughs> I want to kind of do it. What kind well, of she can have fat. Yeah, you, yay, you won. Okay. <laughs> Sunflower oil. There we go. Okay. So that's number one, just that simple. So we'll try the second one now. And um, we're going to do, there's a little thing to, let's see, you all probably moved your boxes around, but there seems to be like a little round thing in there, something round. Yeah, okay. So um, go ahead and take a bite of that. And underneath it, there should be a, a bit of a condiment there, um, something to try with it. And let's just figure out, we now know that the ingredient is plantain. So how does the plantain um, uh, take its form in this particular? Yes, awesome. In this. <laughs> Boiled. Am I right? Kinda. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? Should we <laughs> should we say that that works? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Work. <laughs> All right. Yes. So swag. It's a um, that is a maple plantain spread, and when I um, so that's from Afro Vegan, and I, I wanted to do a, a vegan biscuit. Um, teff is actually the um, primary grain in that biscuit. It's um, one of the staple grains of Ethiopia and Eritrea. And so I was like, huh, how can we add like an Af African diasporic twist to it? And I thought like using plantains and then kind of like visually thinking about, you know, that's been sitting out and oxidizing. So it's not as yellow. But when you first make it, it's really bright yellow. So visually, it kind of reads as butter when you spread it on things. But it's, um, you know, that delicious plantain spread um, with everything in there. And the bourbon really gives it a nice kick mm, yes <laughs> okay awesome all right and so for the final dish here um let's see if anybody can figure out the final thing it's to the side the last thing that should be there um in your in your little box give it a taste this one's going to be hard this one and you get a, a different prize on this one this one's a big one you get a, a beautiful cakey weedy bag so this one's going to be tough if somebody gets this we're, we're going to make them we gotta make them work for this one <laughs> How is the plantain incorporated into this final dish? If Look, I'll put it like this. Whoever gets this, I will, if you don't have one already, I will give you a copy of Black Food. My latest. Oh, okay. I'm that confident that the no deal. one's oh, going to get it. We have a hand. <laughs> okay. The plantain flour. The flour, is that I, you said? Yes. Uh, no, See, no. I, I'm, I'm going to give it to you. It's plantain powder, but I'll take flour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I messed it up. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> we, we'll give you some swag there. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's talk about this dish in, in some detail. Yeah, it's actually um, plantains, like the plantain um, chips that have been ground in a spice grinder. And then I, I sprinkle that stuff on everything. Let me tell you, once you get this in your life, you will be using this plantain powder on every single thing. And so... I, and, and the thing is, I, I actually tell people, you don't have to go through the trouble of making them from scratch. You can get some store-bought green plantain chips, and then you can pulverize them in a, a mortar with a pestle, or you can grind them um, in a spice grinder. What do you guys think? Delicious. Awesome. So where did that, the inspiration for that particular recipe come from? This is a, a favorite of yours. Oh, yeah. I really, that dish, that sweet, the, the, so... The citrus and garlic herb braised fennel. Yeah. So this is a, a recipe from my book, Vegetable Kingdom, which came out in 2019. And, you know, one of the things, this is a beautiful photograph, Ed um, Anderson. But one of the things that I, I said the litmus test for the success of the recipes in this book were if my daughters liked them. So 80% of the recipes, my 10-year-old and 7-year-old, they tested them or tried them, and they gave me the thumbs up or the thumbs down. And when they give me the thumbs down, I'm talking about spitting food out, I'm talking about calling me all types of names. Like they do not like, I appreciate their candor because I know if I can get them to like it, then most people like it. So with this book, it was really part of my mission of, as I was writing the book, helping them to explore the diversity and complexity and beauty of the vegetable kingdom. And so I was introducing them to a lot of things that they, they didn't necessarily, um, hadn't had a lot of before maybe like snuck into a dish but like fennel was one of them you know I had asked them do you guys like fennel do you remember having fennel in any dishes and they're like we don't really remember and I workshopped this this recipe for like two weeks until they were like oh this is it this is it <laughs> so you know just helping them see that you could take this 
fennel bulb that you see at the farmer's market. And the way that I prepare it is I actually, um, I kind of caramelize it in fat for about 20 minutes. So cooking it over medium, low heat, and then using tongs to turn it so that all the sides are starting to like have that golden brown and just really rich, the sweetness is starting to come out. And then I baste it in a mojo sauce, which is this uh, Cuban uh, citrus and garlic based sauce or marinade. And, and just to give you a process, you know, it's kind of like me bringing together the most local seasonal fresh ingredients from Northern California where we live and then like layering in these components of the African diaspora. So the mojo from Cuba, um, because it was already leaning towards this kind of like Afro-Caribbean theme, I decided to um, take plantains and then grind them and add them as a final kind of garnish with the powder. But one of the things I'm really, I love about this recipe is the use of the um, sun chokes. Do people, have people had sun chokes before? So I, I've had sun chokes a lot. Most often when I have them, because we don't cook them a lot at home, but when we eat them out, a lot of times they're kind of like sliced thinly and like fried up as a garnish. Can you describe what they are for? Oh, having? sun chokes or earth apples as they're referred. They're just these little, um, it's a root vegetable and it's kind of like, I don't know. Like yeah, kind of akin to an artichoke. I mean, the flavor, um, well, first of all, some people have issues with, I think, sunchokes can disagree with some people's gastrointestinal. You one of those people? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so some, some of us choose to suffer through the, um, the after effects of having <laughs> sunchokes, which is a lot of gas and cramping for some people. That's not across the board. I hope I'm not ruining this dish by getting into <laughs> the physiological effects. Of <laughs> but... Um, was I saying? Oh, so I wanted to add something that because it needed something that was cooling and creamy to kind of play off of that really like aggressive um, acidic mojo. And so I did this sunchoke um, cream where I, I, I boiled some sunchokes and then I think I sauteed them with some garlic and fat and then I blended them with cashews that had been soaked because one of the um, substitutes for like heavy cream and a lot of plant based cooking is a soak raw cashews um, overnight and then blend them into a cream and it has a fairly neutral flavor. So yeah, this Sancho cream is the final, final thing to finish it off. Do y'all like it? Good? Feeling that? Y'all awesome. it? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so your book just came out um, a few days ago. Um, we're going to be uh, showing them exactly where they can find it. Um, there's multiple ways that they can purchase. The holidays are coming up, so this is a great time to be yeah. buying presents for people. Yeah. Um, where can where can they continue to find it? I mean, they can go to the bookstores. Where other places can they? Look, I, I'm I'm not going to say I'm not going to pretend like I never use Amazon.com because trust me, I do sometimes. <laughs> but you know, we know during this period, um, a lot of people have individuals in business have been struggling economically and I'm, I'm always encouraging people um, especially here in the Bay Area like there's like an independent bookstore on every corner you know so we don't have any excuses I go to towns where the only thing there is books a million <laughs> <laughs> and so I get it but here I, I you know I always say if you can support the independent booksellers um, put some money in their pockets because it's been rough out here for folks so um, yeah. yeah black food Get it for your gifts. Holiday. Give it to everybody. Yes. Yes. I'm proud. And, and I just want to, um, you know, if you want to see more of me, I'm actually um, next week, I think Thursday, I'll be on Good Morning America. And Friday, I'll be on CBS Morning Show. So um, check that out. Send it to your family. Send it to, like, the aunties. Like, these are the type of things, like, you know, my parents, the New York Times, they're like, oh, okay, New Yorker, but Good Morning America, they're like, hey, <laughs> calling up every friend, family member. <laughs> so. That's amazing. Anyway. I have to tell you a little story. I actually met you before. I, I, yeah, you're not going to remember this. Yeah, so this was when I had Pray first. Tell. <laughs> yes, this was when I had first moved to the Bay Area. And um, as David mentioned, I worked in many different restaurants as I was pursuing journalism and getting to a point where I could do things like this um, today. 
And um, I had just started working at one of the restaurants here in the Bay Area. And, you know, in restaurants, sometimes, you know, they'll send somebody out um, when they think that there's, you know, somebody that they have in their staff that can really, like, make sure that they wow, you know, one of the guests that comes in. And so... They're like, it's a black person, get silly. <laughs> <laughs> they grabbed me and they were like, okay, like, you're going to go wait on this table. And I think it was, it was a mixture of different things, but you know, I was able to kind of like, you know, do a great job at this restaurant. And they were like, Brian Terry's here. Like, you're going to go wait on him. I was like, who the, who's Brian Terry? I just moved here. Oh, so sorry. Silly, I, just, I thought we were also, cool. I thought you knew this, was, this was seven years ago. <laughs> and um, I quickly like Google you and I was just like, oh my gosh, this guy's done some amazing <laughs> stuff. And I was really nervous. And you were just so nice to me and just absolutely humble and wonderful. And your, your family was there. And I, I, I imagine that everyone can tell that that's a genuine part of your personality. And I just wanted to say thank you um, because, you know, not everybody treats people in the service industry that way. And, I mean, the point of the story is that, um, you know, you, you need to tip your servers, treat them well, because <laughs> you never know when they're going to be interviewing you. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you to, to Brian. Thank you so much. What um, if this was like some parasite level of revenge story. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna get you. You don't know when, and then she just got up here and just started going off. Like, <laughs> well, that's, look, that's why you're amazing. You can't tell that story without letting me know what restaurant it is. I need to. Leave. Should I? Should I say? Yeah. Is that... I, I. You know what? I think I, I have an idea, and I'm just kind of intuiting it. So. I'm going to hold it, and okay. I'll tell you if it's the right Tell me later. Okay, awesome. So everyone hopefully had fun this evening. Yes, awesome. And hopefully you learned some things. Um, once again, this was our first food event, so thank you all so much for coming. It's really important that um, if you had fun and you enjoyed yourselves that you continue to come. Um, you spread the word with other people so we can continue to fill these seats in this amazing building that um, we really set out to make a space for the community, for all of you. And I'm saying I think that the, the food events are the most fun. So um, the next one that we're doing, um, I'll be hosting again, and I'll be in conversation with Rima Sil, um, a Bay Area Ooh. chef who, yes, she's amazing. She brings her Pakistani and Syrian culture to cuisine and her activism. So I hope that you all can make that event. And if you can't, um, this is also done live. So it's live streamed. You'll be able to see it online. But please buy tickets. Please continue to support. And just a big thank you to each of you for coming out. And um, join me again in thanking Brian. And I, I just want to quickly say I've been on the, so one, I don't know if you saw, but there's merch out there. So we have the black <laughs> food sweatshirts and the tote bags that just came in today. Um, but I, I wanted to let you know that I, I've been supporting this uh, organization, Mothers to Mothers, uh, for about five years now, being on the board. And we do work to uh, address the crisis uh, among um, black and indigenous women with postpartum, um, what is it, um, maternal, we, we call it uh, postpartum justice is what we're really working towards, understanding a lot of disparities in healthcare and um, the, we, the way in which, you know, black women and indigenous women are often, um, you know, treated badly in our healthcare system. So yeah. thank you. For part of the profits are going towards that is why I was telling you that. That's amazing. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much for everything that you do for the community. We really appreciate it. I hope you, everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks. <laughs>